We are finally getting to Kuma's ultimate backstory and I really, really think he's a celestial dragon. I started thinking this at the beginning of the Egghead arc because of all the hints to it. However, I realized that there may have been foreshadowing of his ties to the world nobles all the way back to the very first instance that we saw him. On top of this, the more I looked into Kuma's character, the more I realized that there was a ridiculous amount of evidence to back this claim and that his true lineage is a major key to the revolutionary army and even to the fate of the world government. This theory is a crazy one with too much evidence to not at least be looked at and stay tuned through to the end because it only gets deeper and deeper with guys like Vegapunk and the legend himself, Monkey D. Dragon. Okay, so first off, what hint could there even be to Kuma being a celestial dragon? Like we literally know almost nothing about the bear man. Well, Kuma's name alone is a major factor to him being a celestial dragon since his first name is Bartholomew. The name Bartholomew seems to be based off of Bartholomew the apostle from the bible who's also known as saint bartholomew this seems like a pretty obvious connection since kuma also walks around with the bible and i mean has anyone ever connected kuma's bible to the void century i mean it should have the answers to the noah the adam tree the eve tree and possibly even to the devil fruits and in my opinion the fact that kuma just walks around with it makes him so goddamn interesting i'll bring the bible back up later but for now let me just explain why i believe the bear man is a celestial dragon and okay so now you may wonder, well, what does St. Bartholomew and his Bible have anything to do with his lineage? Well, since he's based off of a real saint, I was wondering that maybe he's a real saint in one piece because remember, the celestial dragons have the title saint before their name. For example, St. Rossward, St. Charlos, St. Mosgard, St. Shalulia, and St. Jalmak all have the title saint before their name. I also find it really ironic that they're called saints since that's the exact opposite of what they really are. And in case you don't know what a saint is, it's someone who's acknowledged as virtuous or someone with very good morals. And unless wanting to put your hands on an underaged mermaid and abuse your slaves makes you a morally good person, I don't quite see why they chose to call themselves that. I mean, I guess they could have done so because they believe they are holy and godly beings. However, let me just say that when I think of a saint, the person who comes to mind is definitely not Charlos's stupid ass. It's honestly probably Drew Brees. But anyways, if you don't think that's enough to prove Bart's a celestial dragon, then check this out. So the first time we're introduced to Bart, he's literally at Marijua, and guess who he's with? He's introduced with Doflamingo, who's a former celestial dragon warlord. Could this really be a coincidence? Could Oda have done this because they are both former celestial dragon warlords going back to their former home, Marijoa. Also, both Dofi and Kuma are similar when they have strange deals with the world government. For example, Kuma made the deal to become their test subject and Dofi made the deal to be able to do what he wants since he can leak the national treasure of Marijoa at any moment. I also think the celestial dragons need some people in the world that are strong since these Dumbos somehow beat the ancient kingdom 800 years ago. If Kuma is a celestial dragon, then it would make sense as to how the original 20 families were actually able to stand a chance. I mean, as of right now, the only strong celestial dragons seem to be Doflamingo, the five elders, Emu, considering that he is a world noble, and of course, Charlos. Bruh. Also notice how when Bonnie steps into Kuma's dream power, she sees that after Kuma gets beat up, a celestial dragon shows up. And the person may be shadowed out, but we can clearly see that he wears his hairstyle in the same way that celestial dragons do. Another huge part of this theory has to do with what Bonnie told us in the Egghead arc, which is that Kuma always told her that he was a part of a special race or a special people, and who else could he be talking about if it's not the celestial dragons? Now, this whole theory doesn't seem so unrealistic now, does it? Remember that Kuma literally was some sort of tyrant, ruler, or king in his younger days, and he could have definitely received that position from his family lineage. This line made by Bonnie may also be tied to something that Moria said about 600 chapters before, which is, I don't know what you're plotting, your kind gives me the creeps. What does he mean by his kind? Is he trying to say that celestial dragons give him the creeps, or is he just saying it generally? I feel like back in the day, this wouldn't have really mattered at all, but when you add it with everything else I've already said, it almost seems like Oda was foreshadowing something here. Now, going back to Bonnie, if she's also the daughter of Kuma, wouldn't that mean that she's also a part celestial dragon? I wonder if that has a part of her escape from the world government after she was captured by Akainu in the pre-time skip. 
I mean, it doesn't really make much sense how she could escape. Like, I guess she could have used her devil fruit powers to trick people. However, I don't think the Navy would allow her to use her powers freely in the first place. Like, I feel like they would give her sea prism cuffs, which makes this whole situation very confusing. And we even see Akanu say that a cold shiver ran through him when he heard that she ran away from the government. What's so important about Bonnie that would even scare Akainu? Does she know some secret about the world government that could not get leaked no matter what? Maybe she knows something huge about the celestial dragons from her backstory. Now, with everything I just explained, if Kuma and Bonnie do belong to the Celestial Dragons, then how is this important to the Revolutionary Army? Well, what if I told you that this is actually the reason for Kuma joining Dragon in the first place? And first of all, wouldn't it just be great writing if a Will of D member and Celestial Dragon member teamed up to end the evil of the world? I mean, this team up could ultimately symbolize that Dragon isn't really after the Celestial Dragons themselves, but he's actually going against what the Celestial Dragons do to the world as a whole. If Kuma is a former world noble himself, this could symbolize that anyone can get along, even natural enemies. And remember that we have seen this sort of relationship before with Corazon and Law, which proves that D-Clan members and Celestial Dragons can get along for the greater good. And now, going back to another reason as to why Kuma's backstory is important to the Revolutionary Army, notice how in Vegapunk's flashback that Dragon created the Revolutionary Army specifically because of the Ohara incident. And knowing this, I would expect Kuma to also join specifically for this reason, or at least for the reason to directly combat the world government. I mean, if anyone knows about the government's true nature, it'd be one of their own people. Now, according to many One Piece characters, the world's view on Kuma seems to be that he was once an evil tyrant. Now, in my opinion, he could be viewed as this for three reasons. One, he's a celestial dragon, so the world views him as a part of the evil that his family is associated with. Two, the world government framed him as an evil man through lies in the news. Or three, he actually used to be an evil ruler, but had a change of heart. Personally, I think it's most likely one of the first two reasons since Sabo and Bonnie show us how kind of a man he truly is. I mean, just look at Kuma. Doesn't he just look like the nicest, most loving kind of guy? His 22 feet 7 inch height, monotone voice, and cold hearted stares surely doesn't scare me at all. But on a more serious note, Kuma once being some sort of ruler and also seeming to be connected to Celestial Dragons was probably the very reason for him joining Dragon since he must have seen the evil acts done by the gods of the world firsthand. He probably saw a whole lot of slavery, torture, and other cruel things every single goddamn day if he was around Marijua. He probably despises the Celestial Dragons and wants to see a world where people can defend themselves from them and a world where people don't have to fear them. I also really think that the Bible that he walks around with is a huge factor in joining Dragon since they probably solved a bit of the secrets of the world with it. They most likely solved some of the secrets to things like the Noah, Adam Tree, Eve Tree, and possibly even things about the winged races. Vegapunk also reminded us that Ohara solved the Ancient Kingdom's name through ancient manuscripts, and I wouldn't be surprised if this book was one of the ancient manuscripts in their library. I mean, name a more famous ancient book or writing that isn't the Bible. Like, this honestly may have even been how Kuma and Dragon bonded in the first place. Like, Kuma may have showed him his own theories on the Ancient Kingdom and on the Void Century through the book. Now, there's a lot more on this topic with the Bible, which has to do with the Sun God Nika and the One Piece. However, it's really off topic for this video, so subscribe to the channel because my next video will be on how Dragon's Tattoo, Kuma's Bible, and Vegapunk's and Roger's quotes tells us exactly what the name of the Ancient Kingdom was and literally what the One Piece is. I'm really, really excited to drop that video, so subscribe if you want to see it. But now, going back to Bart, if he learned some of the ancient history through the Bible, he could have understood that the ancient manuscripts in Ohara could reveal things that are detrimental to the world government. He probably learned more about the Void Century and things of that nature after meeting Dragon, but I definitely think he too had to be pretty upset at the Ohara incident. It also did seem like Kuma was Dragon's right hand man at one point, which was later replaced by Sabo, and if this is true, then Kuma most likely knows just as much as Dragon does about the true history. Try to keep in mind that this could be a lot of knowledge since Dragon is someone close to Vegapunk, a man who knows as much as Ohara knew, maybe even more with his knowledge on devil fruits and science. It's honestly just so insane that Vegapunk literally knows the name of the ancient kingdom and hasn't spoiled it to us yet. I hope he doesn't spoil it and I hope we learn the name of it when we see the One Piece because I still have some theories to make on it. Please Oda, give me some time to make these videos. And now the most interesting thing about all of this is the fact that even though Kuma 
probably knows somewhat of what the Void Sentry is, he still decided to work with the world government, become the robot slave, and even be known as the only warlord who obeys the government like a dog. I mean, Jinbei did tell us that he became a pirate that was associated with the Revolutionary Army until the Navy captured him and sentenced him to a life imprisonment. Jinbei then says that after this, Vegapunk really wanted to use Kuma as a science test on body augmentation and clone development, and with this, Kuma was allowed to be free again as a warlord. Now, this whole situation seems very suspicious since I don't think that Vegapunk saved Kuma for the simple reasons that Jinbei heard about, and I think the real reason Vegapunk helped Kuma out was because Dragon told him to because Kuma is one of his closest friends in the Revolutionary Army. I feel like everything Kuma has done has a good reason behind it or a good intention, and Bonnie kind of even hints at it being deeper than what's on the surface when she says that becoming a cyborg just doesn't make any sense, especially when you're going to become a slave for the very government that she claims he hated. I mean, why would Kuma, a revolutionary, become a dog, slave, and lab rat for the world government? Like, could there actually be some hidden purpose for this? Well, what if I told you that the true reason he did this will make him love so much more by the One Piece community and that it'll make him go down as a legend? There's even evidence from the manga for this, so check this out. So we see that Kuma requested certain things from Vegapunk, like when he asked to do his final mission, which was to protect the Straw Hat ship, until one of them came back. And knowing that he did this, really makes me believe that Dragon also requested Vegapunk to program him to do certain jobs or secret missions. There may even be proof of this, which is when we see Dragon and Kuma talk for the first time after his rescue at the Reverie, where Dragon says, Tell me Kuma, what is it that you've seen? Is Dragon hinting at that one of Kuma's missions was to possibly spy on the world government for him and the revolutionaries? Like could you imagine if Kuma was just getting so much information on them this whole time? I mean, maybe that's why he's known as the only warlord who obeys the government like a dog. Maybe he obeys them because as he does so, he actually gains their trust, or is at least around them enough to roam around places like Marijua, looking around for certain secrets without making it completely obvious. I mean, this would actually turn out to be insane if it were true, and Bart sacrificing his body and ultimately his life for this would make him one of the most sympathized characters in One Piece. After this happens, we never actually see what Kuma was going to tell Dragon since Sabo calls and the whole Lucia incident occurs. Now, the strangest thing of all of this is that Kuma ends up having what looks to be some sort of malfunction since even Dragon seems to be confused as to what he's doing. And we then see him fly straight into the red line as if he were a terrorist flying into the World Trade Center and then he starts climbing the red line like Fisher Tiger trying to get to the very top. However, unlike Fisher, he falls after being attacked by the Navy and has to go up against them all by himself. Now, why the heck is Kuma heading to Marijoa right after he was saved by the Revolutionary Army. Could it possibly have something to do with what Dragon asked him? Could it have something to do with what Sabo said about the throne of the world? Did Vegapunk encode another secret mission in Kuma that we don't yet know about? Well, whatever it was, something definitely triggered him to fight the government head on, and it almost seems like a parallel with the ancient giant robot heading to Marijua 200 years ago. Vegapunk did say that he used the robot as a guide to create the Vega Force 1. However, he couldn't figure out how to recreate its dynamic power source, which shows that he didn't put any of the ancient technology into Kuma. Let me know in the comments why you think Kuma flew head first into the red line, and also how he was even able to do it. I also really wonder what's going to happen to the revolutionaries from here on out. Like I mean, it really seems like one bad thing after another keeps happening to them, since they lost both Sabo and Kuma in the span of a day. I feel like they may need some help to fight the world government since they don't have two of their strongest forces right now, and click on this video right here to see how they'll defeat the government with Joy Boy and the help of a country that was once ruled by celestial dragons.